<laughs> Say hi, Leo. You will once again record me saying things don't prevent me from getting confirmed anything. You would never be appointed in the first place, so don't worry about it. I, I, I'm not <laughs> worried about it for precisely that reason. Uh, so we'll start in about 30 seconds. Uh, meanwhile, I'll keep the suspense going until then. <laughs> Uh, as I said, each person will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes to start, then I'll let each, if you want to, respond to things said by others, and we'll throw it open to the audience. Right? Okay, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for waking up at this ungodly hour and coming to this exciting panel on federal power over immigration, which, if nothing else, is certainly a very timely, hot topic. Uh, my name is Ilya Soman. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the other panelists and myself, uh, only saying a little bit about each of them. They have incredibly impressive credentials, but if I listed all of them, that would take up all the time that we have, so you can read about them if you want to on their respective websites. So we're going to go in alphabetical order for lack of a better or more original procedure. Uh, and I'll start with Josh Blackman, who is an associate professor, it says in my notes, South Texas College of Law, but is it officially now Houston College of Law? <laughs> South Texas College of Law, Houston. Thank you. So uh, there, there is a, some, somewhat of a controversy involving your name, which itself could be the subject of a panel, but I'm going to press on and merely point out that Josh teaches <laughs> constitutional law. Uh, and he is the author of an, a number of books, including most recently, Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. I can't forbear to mention his most important credential, which is that he's my, actually one of my former students. Uh, <laughs> next, we have uh, Professor Jennifer Chacon. She's a professor at the School of Law at the U of California, Irvine. She writes very extensively on immigration, criminal law, constitutional law, and citizenship, and does obviously issues very much related to our topic today. Uh, next, we have Jill Family. She is the Commonwealth Professor of Law and Government and the Director of the Law and Government Institute at Widener University Commonwealth Law School, and she is an internationally renowned expert in uh, law. And also, then we have Anil Kalan, who is Associate Professor of Law at the Drexel University uh, and uh, Thomas R. Klein School of Law. He's also the chair of the New York City Bar Association's International Human Rights Committee. He too has written extensively on immigration law issues of great relevance <coughs> to the panel today. Uh, and finally, my name is Ilya Soman. I'm a law professor at George Mason University. I teach constitutional law and property my most recent book is Democracy and Political Ignorance, which came out in a spiffy new and updated edition during the past election. So without further ado, uh, we're going to start with Josh Blackman and then move in alphabetical order. And then we'll have a brief time where the panelists can respond to, we'll throw it open to what I know will be your interesting and insightful questions. Thank you. So thank you all for coming out at 8.30 in the morning on a, a, a beautiful day uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I'm very happy with Ilya and my other friends. Uh, Ilya was my property professor, uh, 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 and we have had the pleasure of working together on a number of issues. Uh, my remarks will open the stage with what was perhaps the biggest immigration case last year that went nowhere, which is, of course, U.S. v. Texas. And for full disclosure, I filed several briefs in this case. On behalf of Texas, I'm, uh, it's for the Cato Institute. Peter Margulies, is my co-author in those briefs, uh, is also in the House. Um, so how did this case begin? So to tell the story of U.S. and Texas, we have to go back even further. Not only to DAPA, not, not only to DACA, but the DREAM Act. Now, the DREAM Act was a piece of legislation which people in this room are familiar with. It would provide a pathway to citizenship for the DREAMers. These are people who came here uh, 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 without any authorization. They stuck around. Good people, graduate from school, no criminal background, good people. Uh, the DREAM Act, which I would have supported as a matter of policy, would have given them a pathway to citizenship. The DREAM Act did not make it through um, a, 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 a Congress. We actually had the House representatives, then a Democrat control, pass it. But there was a filibuster in the Senate. Well, remember, Democrats joined that filibuster, but there was a filibuster no less. What happened next? About six months after the DREAM Act failed to pass through Congress, 
uh, Secretary Napolitano uh, announced a policy known as DACA, which are acronym straight, D-A-C-A, Deferred Action for the Childhood Arrivals. Now, some sort of amnesty to didn't give citizenship. What it did do was it granted uh, a deferred action status to roughly a million and a half of the dreamers. And what's deferred action status? Uh, it says, we are going to put you on the bottom of the line for deportation, and we will also give you lawful presence. And as a consequence of lawful presence, the aliens now have work authorization and a host of other federal benefits. But work authorization is a biggie, because once you can work legally, uh, that, that's a really huge change in a person's lifestyle. Um, there were a spattering of challenges to DACA in court by Sheriff Joe Arpaio and some uh, people in Mississippi and some immigration officials. Uh, but those challenges, whether they were you know, standing or not, they never really got big salience. Uh, why? I don't think people were particularly disturbed by the, uh, uh, by the DACA policy because it seemed humanitarian, right? These were children. They had no fault of their own for coming here, whatever. Okay, fast forward a couple years to the Gang of Eight Bill. You remember this is what brought Marco Rubio down, as we thought. Um, the Gang of Eight Bill would have given a pathway to decisions for uh, roughly maybe 15 million uh, uh, aliens who are not here legally. Uh, it's, it's a fairly big number the entire corpus. Um, this bill actually passed the Senate with, again, Marco Rubio and other Republicans joining onto this plan. Something crazy happened. The bill went to the House, and the House was considering it, and by all accounts, there was sufficient support in the House to pass the bill. Then there was a special election. Uh, a, a representative from Virginia, uh, Eric Cantor, who was the House Majority Leader, uh, had a, a primary challenge. He did it by a guy named David Bratt, who was actually a professor, you probably never heard of him. And one of the key reasons why Bratt was victorious was because of immigration, because Cantor <coughs> had supported the uh, a Gang of Eight bill. And after that, Republicans said, oh crap, we don't want to get primary. This was actually, if you're reading the tea leaves, a precursor to what happened about two months ago. This was trickling up. I don't think most people in this room, at least and others, didn't realize how great this sentiment was. So even though the bill was a Batsby vote on the House, Speaker Boehner said, um, no, we are not putting this up for a vote like two months before the election where guys can get killed. Um, so there was no vote in the Gang of Eight bill. That day, a couple hours later, President Obama appeared in the Rose Garden, and he gave a remark, and, and I encourage you to read the transcript. It's a remarkable statement. He says, where Congress won't act, I will. I will take executive action where Congress won't. Um, he didn't take any action right away. In fact, over the entire summer of 2013, 2014, there were all these debates about we do this, we do that, and you know, people were writing letters, some law professors wrote a bunch of letters saying do this, do that, whatever. Wait till after the election. So November, oh God, 14th or 17th, might be off in the day, of 2014, President Obama took to the, uh, the, the White House with a speech, and he said, I am taking executive action to protect immigrants, and this was DAPA. D-A-P-A, -A, which stands for Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents. Doppler never had the right ring, so it simply became DAPA. Also, Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. We've heard different phrasings, but I'll just call it DAPA to make it easier. What was DAPA? It was designed to be similar to DACA in that it utilized uh, this Deferred Action and Lawful Presence approach to allow aliens who are not here lawfully to get some sort of work authorizations. Now, who did it apply to? It did not only apply to the uh, Dreamers, which was the first go-around. This one applied to the parents of U.S. citizens and lawful permanent. And the number of people who benefit was roughly uh, 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 four to five million. You've seen different estimates. I don't know the exact number. <laughs> okay. Um, why was this controversial? Now, uh, contrary to the anchor baby myth, and I call it a myth because it's a myth, a child born in the U.S. cannot petition for a green card for the parents until they're 21, right? So there's a significant gap of time after a child born here through birth right citizenship until they can bring their parent in with a change of status. Um, this basically said, no, you, you, we're not gonna make you leave the country and come back in 21 years. Um, uh, so if you were the parent of a US citizen and you were not here legally, you can then petition the government for this program uh, 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 and you would be getting deferred action, work authorization, et cetera, et cetera. That was at least the plan. Within about oh, wait, wait, five days of the announcement, Attorney General Abbott, now Governor Abbott, um, announced that he would be challenging the legality of DAPA. Um, and, and putting aside the, uh, uh, the merits of the case, th this was assembled very quickly. And the lawyers in the Texas AG were, were very crafty in how they designed this case. And I don't want to go into standing, but they made a very um, uh, uh, crafty decision 
to have an expert witness uh, testify the cost in terms of driver's licenses, right? If all these DAPA beneficiaries were able to obtain driver's license, what effect would it have in the state's budget? They actually had this in the record, and that's basically what saved the case. Whether you like it or not, the lawyers there were very crafty in putting this together on short notice. They also did a little bit of form shopping, and they, they, they filed the case in the district where there's only one judge who could have conceivably gotten the case, and Judge Hayden tends to be fairly uh, strong on enforced immigration. So they, they, they brought this case very deliberately. And again, I filed briefs uh, in the district, circuit, and Supreme Court. I, I batted the cycle, I suppose. Okay, so what was their claim? The first claim was that uh, this was a policy that should have gone through notice and comment, not just announced by the president from on high. Uh, the second claim was that this was substantively unreasonable, that the statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act, didn't support this broad delegation of authority to employ deferred action on this wide scale. Uh, the third argument which interested me the most as a common law professor was the take care clause. The president's required to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. This is a duty most of you probably never study in common law, my students do. Uh, and I think it's the fulcrum of the entire separation of powers because the president can't be forced to do stuff other than the take care clause, the entire thing falls apart. Texas indeed filed this challenge and, and, and the initial round of the briefing, most people laughed at it. Uh, and they said this case is stupid. I didn't think so, but a lot of people said this case is stupid. Um, uh, Judge Hainan indeed entered a nationwide injunction putting DAPA on hold. Um, as a consequence, the policy never went into effect and most likely never will go into effect. Uh, the case was appealed up to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, uh, the Fifth Circuit first denied a stay and in the subsequent decision um, uh, ruled uh, 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 that the preliminary injunction was properly granted. And then it got funny. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court. And when certiorari was granted, I think, uh, there were nine justices on board. And by all accounts, in hindsight, there were five votes to invalidate uh, uh, the policy. But by the time the case was actually argued, and I was sitting there, I was five feet behind Paul Clement, right? Uh, or sorry, Aaron Murphy uh, from ba Bancroft and others, and Scott Keller from the Texas SG. Confusing Zubik, it was two cases in a week I was, I was there for. Uh, by the time the case was argued uh, in UC Texas, there were only eight. Uh, Justice Scalia had passed away. Um, and the arguments were, were very uh, uh, divided. I mean, from my perspective, it seemed pretty pretty clear that the liberals were going to side with the President Obama and the conservatives were going to side with, with uh, 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 the, the state of Texas. Um, curiously, on, this, on the standing issue, uh, putting standing aside, Gins Justice Ginsburg said in an interview that she actually thought Texas had standing, which I think should make old people here happy when California tries to start suing Trump, because that's been the next big thing, you know, out Texas suing Obama, in California suing Trump. That's, that's, a, new, that's a new black, I guess. Um, but uh, 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 on the merits, uh, the case looked through 4 4. And indeed, that's what happened. The final decision was released, and it was eight words. I often I have a piece in Harvard Law Review. It begins What are eight words nine justices can ever say, affirmed by an equally divided margin? Ooh. Indeed, so the case was simply affirmed. What does it mean to affirm by an equally divided margin? There's no opinion, there's no precedent set. The judgment of the Fifth Circuit, which was divided, uh, is the law of the land now in all 50 states. Subsequent to the USP Texas decision, there were actually attempts to challenge this nationwide injunction. In fact, suits were filed in Brooklyn, uh, in Chicago, I think in LA, uh, uh, by um, a very small sliver of individuals who uh, uh, would have benefited, I don't want to get to the specifics, but it's a very specific sliver who would have benefited from this expansion of authority, and they're basically trying to craft a circuit split and hoping that the Supreme Court takes it up. Um, I was actually paying close attention to those cases no longer. Uh, uh, because probably in about, what do we got, 15 days, um, uh, DAPA will be rescinded. And it'll be fairly easy to rescind because there's no one actually gotten it. So those cases simply disappear. Um, uh, the bigger question, as we, I'm sure, it, it's an evergreen statement. When we planned this conference, we thought X, but now we think Y, right? The, the tenor of this debate, which Ilya uh, helped uh, organize, uh, has evolved significantly in the last, I don't know, three months or so. Um, so the big question, uh, DAPA is a goner, right? The, the, the policy never went to effect, it's easy to kill. Uh, the bigger question is DACA, the, the, the dreamers, right? What happens to them? And uh, there's a couple of moving parts here that we should, we should think about carefully. Um, first, I think it's fairly certain to say new applicants will not get it, right? So if you haven't applied yet, you're probably not going to. I bet there'll be a swarm of people applying now, but maybe not. Why? For an alien who's not here legally, there's a risk of handing over the information to the government. Um, Jay Johnson recently, the Homeland Security, said, well, when they gave us this information, we promised we would not hand it over to the immigration, right? We would keep it for DAPA. Okay. That statement was made in a blog post. 
Um, there's actually a piece by Zach Price argues that people have a reliance interest, a due process interest in not having this information turned over. I don't know. So DAPA gone, DACA probably gone. Um, and now the big question, which I'll probably handle in, 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 during the Q&A portion, is what happens with states' efforts to thwart federal immigration enforcement. And uh, we've come full circle with Arizona v. the U.S., the, the, the idea that immigration was purely a province of the feds and the states can't uh, uh, interfere uh, or can't do anything to interfere. And now I think we'll see uh, some of that in reverse. Thank you all so much. I look forward to your questions. And from here, my esteemed uh, panelists. Good morning. Um, I'm happy to be able to participate in this panel. Thanks to Ilya for the invitation. Um, I'm going to uh, proceed in three parts. I'm going to try to be brief and to the time for Q&A because there are a lot of people who have a lot of things to say. Um, I first want to talk briefly about the USB Texas case. And I want to actually, we've gotten background on uh, uh, how the case came to be. Um, and on all the acronyms, so I can skip all of that, which is good. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I want to just pay particular attention to an important issue that I've heard the case and that will persist and shape considerably the contours of enforcement discretion, and that is the limited federal administrative capacity to actually deport. Um, and second, I'm going to include some thoughts on how this capacity issue is going to impact the choices of the incoming administration um, and, and lay out some of the things that I think we might see uh, in coming months. Uh, and finally, I'm going to turn briefly to the uh, question of the role of Congress and the role of states and localities, the role of states that they're going to have in shaping uh, in the Trump administration. So I wanted to start with the U.S. versus Texas case. Um, so uh, as uh, Josh already stated, the case challenged executive authority to grant for action to a broad class of unauthorized migrants, individuals who were otherwise removable under the law because of their lack of lawful immigration status. Deferred action is an oddity. It existed in practice for a long time. It has a long and rich uh, legal history. Uh, it's, uh, it's a legal category that is statutorily recognized through the Real ID Act and judicially acknowledged in Supreme Court, by the Supreme Court uh, for Justice Scalia in uh, the ABC versus Reno. It's also the subject of significant decades of notice and comment rulemaking. So because of notice and comment rules enacted in the 1980s and the 1990s, that the deferred action designation that the Obama administration extended to DACA designees and attempts to extend to DAPA designees actually resulted uh, in the benefit of driver's licenses, social security numbers that became the uh, subject of much of litigation um, by opponents of the DAPA program. Um, so opponents of DAPA suggested uh, that DAPA was not deferred action as it had been understood and discussed in those earlier rulemaking processes. Among other things, they argued that it was too vast. But the limitations that they urged are not self-evident on the face of the statute or the rules. Um, so the legal arguments that DAPA and DACA exceeded the regulatory parameters of deferred action turn on debatable points about legislative uh, history and deferred intent. Uh, the simple fact is that the presidential that presidential administrations have long been able to designate individuals for deferred action, that the statutes and regulations have bestowed such beneficiaries with particular legal benefits. But the scope and formality of the DACA and the DACA processes expose those practices to new scrutiny and in uh, our political climate to new challenges. In defending the DAPA program, the Obama administration, I'm not going to focus so much on the Texas litigation because for a variety of reasons, uh, I think the DAPA will be defended. I don't think there's a movement on that front. Uh, and I, uh, I, I think the DACA program, um, too, will not be expanded uh, in this upcoming administration, uh, although its status remains to be seen. In defending the DAPA program, the Obama administration repeatedly reiterated that it only had the capacity to remove about 400,000 non-citizens a year. When we think about what that means, we should also think about the broader population we're talking about. Estimates of the unauthorized population place that number at just over 11 million. Additionally, there are tens of thousands of lawful permanent residents and short-term visa holders who are potentially deportable on the basis of civil or criminal violations uh, that might have been uh, put them in violation of their facially valid visas. Um, and although the numbers are at historic lows, there are still an incoming flow of unauthorized migrants. There's still an incoming flow of unauthorized migrants who, in theory, although not really often in practice, are entitled to screening for a determination of their persecution uh, in their home country so as to entitle them to additional procedural protections before their removal. The administration clearly lacked the capacity to remove everyone removable under the statute. Choices had to be made, and the Obama administration decided to make those choices from the top, both by announcing enforcement priorities and then, when implementing 
and those priorities turned out to be extremely spotty on the ground by announcing non-priorities formally to DAPA and the DACA classes. Administrations up to and including the Obama administration have long made choices about enforcement priorities. And that's why we have a large and stable and authorized population in this country. Clinton, Bush II, and Obama all removed lots of non-citizens, but they also chose not to remove millions of others, and I use the word chose advisor. Uh, stretching back for decades, you can find INS and ICE priority memoranda designating some subset of the unauthorized population priorities for deportation and others non priority Trump has indicated, actually, that he will do some version of the same thing. He's told us that he will target a nebulous and yet to be defined category of bad hombres <coughs> for removal. Um, he has claimed he wants to target two to three million of these bad hombres in his first term. Um, but he has also said he'll let the, quote, terrific ones, also nebulous and let yet to be defined, remain. Um, so that is a, another symbol that this pattern of enforcement discretion will persist uh, into the next administration. Million removals in the first term brings us back to that 400,000 number, which, be, uh, which would be administrative capacity cited by the Obama administration in their justification for DACA and DACA. I think the 400,000 number is in some ways an overstatement of capacity, particularly when we're focused on the specific populations that we would have been covered by DAPA, that is, long-time residents in the United States with citizen children and no criminal residents. That firmly rooted population is most likely to contest removal and is entitled under law to relatively robust removal proceedings. And there are simply not enough immigration courts and immigration judges to process these claims in anything like the time of The administration has uh, prior prioritize recent entrance for detention and for removal, long-term residents in removal proceedings are already receiving hearing dates that extend out beyond the end of the first Trump term. Immigration attorneys in Denver and in other places around the country have clients getting court dates for 2020 and beyond. Um, so we have a, a bunch of people who are not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. So there are lots of things that could happen uh, in the next coming as a consequence of this sort of mismatch uh, between stated priorities and desires on um, natural capacity. Um, one is that Congress may increase resources for removal, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but what I need to highlight here is the significant mismatch between Congress's categories of deportable people and Congress's resource allocation for the actual work of deportation. This has been a long-term congressional strategy to enact tough laws to place re police restrictionist constituencies and then to underfund enforcement efforts at the national level, and in some instances, to actively subvert immigration enforcement in their own jurisdictions to appease business and other constituencies. The bottom line is that the law allows for the removal of a lot more people than the immigrant states can possibly process. Discretion is baked in, and it's not going away on January 20th. So what might we expect to see Trump doing to use his administrative discretion uh, to deal with this reality, and what responses might we expect from Congress and from states and localities? First, looking to Trump, um, in the absence of a massive infusion of resources to immigration courts, I think one thing we're likely to see in this administration is on already uh, we're already heavily relied upon uh, statutory powers to circumvent immigration courts in removal proceedings. Um, so we might expect to see an expansion, uh, expanded reliance on expedited removal, um, which circumvents the need for an immigration judge in certain categories of cases for recent entrance near the border, um, and that category has been um, in a limited fashion uh, by the current administration, prior administrations that could be expanded uh, to, to, uh, to encompass more people um, who have been here for longer periods of time uh, to move them immediately into administrative proceedings rather than to immigration courts. I expect that we'll see continued and perhaps expanded reliance on criminal processes immigration law goals because we have criminal justice resources into uh, into the prosecution of immigration crimes. Uh, and so then you can prosecute immigration crimes of uh, federal uh, misdemeanor illegal entry and re-entry uh, and uh, have those convictions followed by expedited removals or reinstating removal orders with no need again for immigration courts and immigration judges. Uh, thereby you get the leveraging of the criminal justice mechanism uh, to achieve immigration, uh, immigration goals. I expect that we'll see greater tolerance for illegal border patrol and ICE practices that is, uh, lack of meaningful, credible fear hearings at the border, um, ex uh, expanded uh, reliance of, of uh, coercive stipulated orders of removals. Already, these agencies are under watch and under discipline for these irregularities, and I expect that that, um, that lack of oversight will really worsen. I expect that there'll be less funding for internal investigations and discipline, which are already inadequate, and that we can expect that 
uh, removals can be accelerated in this fashion, thereby circumventing some of the requirements of international law as well as our requirements. I expect that we'll see decreased standards for detention. This will allow for greater capacity, cheaper detention by private, uh, by private actors. And that expansion of private detention will mean that more people who are in proceedings will be detained as they're in proceedings, which will lead, again, to more stipulated removal. So that the longer you have to wait for a hearing that's never coming, the more likely you are to abandon your valid claim for attrition. Um, so I expect that's another way that we'll have circumvention of court processes, or circumvention of judge processes, uh, that will facilitate faster deportation. I expect that we'll see the deployment of resources against uh, particular national origins thinly disguised religious discrimination. We can talk more about that in the um, So courts may be able to provide some minimal due process checks here, uh, but we need to remember that the immigration statute uh, gives a great deal of power to circumvent normal procedural processes in this realm, and that is a place where the rights revolution has passed us by, and that ought to be a very big concern for all of us as we watch how the immigration process unfolds months. Um, so then what is, what is the role of Congress here and what is the role of states? Oh, I have one minute. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about this in Q&A. Um, I think one thing that we should uh, note is that uh, I expect that uh, we will see, um, and, and Josh alluded to this, um, some uh, efforts on the part of states and localities, particular states and localities, um, to provide uh, protective measures, provide protective measures and resistance uh, to some of the um, some of, some of the efforts uh, to uh, leverage state and local law enforcement resources to achieve immigration enforcement ends. So we're already seeing um, things in places like the state of California, the California Trust Act, um, sanctuary cities, um, saying that they won't engage in voluntary information gathering and collection um, or turning over information uh, that they're not otherwise required by law to turn over uh, to the <coughs> um, in order to protect their constituencies. Um, and so I expect that we'll, we'll the uh, litigation uh, and, 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 uh, and political discussion focusing on the question of what, uh, what states and localities are required to do and what capacity uh, the, uh, the incoming administration has to require them to do more. Congress really needs to act um, here. Um, much of what uh, states are doing through uh, things like the Trust Act or sanctuary cities are doing through things like their own ordinances are saying, we will comply with federal law, but that's all we will do. Additional obligations. Um, if Congress wanted to, presumably, they could try to impose additional uh, uh, additional uh, requirements uh, on states and localities, um, and um, and that would be then the subject of uh, discussion or debate under anti commandeering principles, which is something that I'm hoping that we can talk more about uh, in the Q and A as well. Um, finally, I think uh, the, the, you know the capacity of the of the federal government to remove. Now, people will require congressional action, uh, if not by requiring greater state and local cooperation, um, then certainly um, by requiring increased resources, if, especially if uh, the incoming administration is truly committed uh, to the removal of 2 million people in their first term. So Congress will now have a very real option of buying into a hardline agenda by increasing funding for enforcement and testing the limits of the Tenth Amendment line through funding conditions that mandate information collection and information sharing of pertinent information information sharing pertinent to immigration enforcement. They could attempt to authorize racially or religiously targeted measures as well, the plenary powers doctrine merely to survive the right revolution and um, touch. And if Congress chooses to assist in the most radical policy proposals advanced by Trump, uh, the court will either need to take new approaches to these old problems, um, that is, they'll have to do something about them in ways that they haven't before, or that they'll simply move out of the way. Um, and history suggests that they might choose the latter. Um, and all of this is to say that Congress has uh, always had and continues to have a tremendous uh, power when it comes to these questions of immigration policy and what they do in the coming months uh, uh, and how states and localities react to uh, and, and interact with those choices large role in shaping um, the, the face of immigration enforcement. Uh, in <laughs> Sorry for being <me> dead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm Jill Family. I'm a professor at Weiner Commonwealth Law School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm very happy to be here. And I really mean that. I'm very happy to be here because I'll tell you the story later if you want to hear it, but it took me 18 hours to get here yesterday <laughs> in Pennsylvania, including stops in 
Philadelphia, Kansas City, Phoenix, and then San Francisco. <laughs> so, <clears throat> thank you. But actually, uh, we didn't plan this, uh, but the end of Jennifer's talk was actually a really nice segue into um, my talk, which is I really want to focus my comments on what I consider to be a fundamental core concept that's sort of behind um, the topic of this whole panel, and that's sovereignty. And I've really come to the conclusion over the past couple of years that a lot of these issues and debates that we're having in immigration law, on the one sense, are legal debates, but also really require us to think about what sovereignty means in the context of immigration law, and that we really need a cultural in our concept of immigration sovereignty. And by cultural revolution, I mean not just you know, the Supreme Court maybe saying, you know, no more plenary power doctrine, but also just more of a, a more popular, um, different popular understanding of the role of sovereignty in immigration law. So what is immigration sovereignty? Um, I'm really referring here um, both to the power of the federal government to regulate immigration, so that would be power of the federal government versus the states, and also the nature of that federal governmental power. And both of those things um, rest on notions of sovereignty. Because the Supreme Court in the late 19th century um, notions of sovereignty, both to justify the federal government's supreme power over immigration and to justify the broad nature of that power. And the political branches have, as Jennifer mentioned, um, what has been described as a plenary power over um, certain aspects of immigration law. Uh, the Chinese exclusion case in 1889, uh, the Supreme Court described the power to regulate immigration as incident to national sovereignty. And the facts of that case surround correct congressional action at the time to prohibit future immigration from China, just no immigration from China at all. But initially, the congressional action allowed Chinese immigrants already in the United States um, to stay and said that those who had proper documentation that they you know, were in the United States before the Chinese exclusion laws, that they could travel outside of the United States and return. And while one individual with that documentation was traveling, Congress then passed the law while that individual was out of the country that said, oh no, we're no longer going to honor that documentation. So even though this individual left in reliance on having that documentation, um, this individual was refused entry back into the United States, and that individual challenged his exclusion. And in the opinion, ultimately, upholding the validity of the Chinese exclusion laws, the Supreme Court described the motivations behind those laws. And so um, this is a quote. The Supreme Court said, um, as they grew in numbers each year, the people of the coast saw or believed they saw in the facility of immigration and in the crowded millions of China presses upon the means of substance, substance, subsistence, sorry, great danger that at no distant day that portion of our country would be overrun by them unless prompt action was taken to restrict their immigration. The people there accordingly petitioned earnestly for protective legislation. And the Supreme Court goes on to say the presence of Chinese laborers had a baneful effect upon the material interests of the state and upon public morals, that their immigration was in numbers approaching the character of an oriental invasion and was a menace to our civilization. And in that same case, deciding whether the federal government had the power to revoke the permission to re-enter, the Supreme Court said, quote, that the government of the United States through the action of the legislative department can exclude aliens from its territory is a proposition which we do not think open to controversy. Jurisdiction over its own territory to that extent is incident of every independent nation. Independence, if it could not exclude aliens, it would be to that extent subject to the control of another power. And one more quote, I promise and then I'm done. To preserve its independence and give security against foreign aggression and encroachment, it is the highest duty of every nation, and to attain these ends, nearly all other considerations are to be subordinated. It matters not in what form such aggression and encroachment come, whether from the foreign nation acting in its national character 
or from vast hordes of its people crowding in upon us. And from there, uh, we have set a course in the United States where immigration is thought of as a threat to sovereignty. I do not mean to argue here that sovereignty has no meaning or significance in immigration law. What I do mean to argue is that the idea that immigration is inherently antithetical to sovereignty has been the overwhelming theme and the default assumption of immigration law discourse and that this framing has seeped into popular notions of immigrants and immigration law as well. This threat to sovereignty framework is so ingrained that it will take more than just legal change to recalibrate the balance between government power and individual rights in immigration law. The sovereignty theme is illustrated today and has been since the late 19th century by our reluctance to fully commit to our immigrants. U.S. commitment to immigrants is often hedged, and immigration law sends conflicting signals. The sovereignty line between us, those lucky enough to have been born into or to have achieved membership in a citizenship club, so the line between us and them, location of hedged positions throughout the history of immigration law. So, for example, uh, there is a legal immigration selection system, but that system um, excludes many. Legal, legal immigrants are welcome, but that welcome may be retracted for a wide, wide, wide variety of reasons. Policymakers recognize that immigrants can be good, but at the same time, policymakers denounce immigration and equate it to a national security threat. Immigrants have earned some constitutional protections since the 19th century, but are still excluded from many others. Some individuals in removal proceedings are given a hearing, but as Jennifer mentioned, not everyone. For those who do get a hearing, that hearing takes place in a dysfunctional adjudication system that is scheduled for <laughs> hearing many years out. For most, there is no right to government-funded counsel within that system, um, and once a hearing is underway, relief from removal is available, but its prerequisites make it impossible to access for many. Um, these, this tradition of hedging um, and this tradition of, um, invoking of invoking notions of sovereignty is also um, been continued by President elect Trump. Um, he has invoked notions of sovereignty to justify his immigration prerogative. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, he's expressed his plans to be able to support millions of foreign nationals immediately upon taking office. Um, in the Washington Post, he said, day one, my first hour in office, so people are gone. Um, in a 2015 interview of uh, 60 Minutes, he said, I know it doesn't sound nice, but not everything is nice. That was Trump said that. Um, Scott Pelley, who was interviewing him, says, it doesn't sound practical. He said, there's something called civil rights, to which Trump said, there is also a call to have a country. Now, the legality of Trump's plans is more complicated. Um, individuals in the United States, whether they're here legally or not, are entitled to due process protections. How much due process a Trump administration will give and the, whether there will be subsequent legal challenges or open questions. The president does, however, have, as others have mentioned, have wide-ranging prosecutorial discretion when it comes to immigration law. So President Trump can choose to focus his immigration resources, um, but he does so under the uh, with at least with respect to those inside the United States under the watchful eye of the due process clause. For those who have not yet entered the United States, the Supreme Court is actually hearing a case this term that challenges whether the Constitution offers protection to those who are applying for initial admission into the United States. Rodriguez, the Supreme Court, has asked for supplemental briefing on this particular question. So we'll see what kind of clarity, if any, um, Jennings provides. If Jennings clarifies that the Constitution does protect those um, applying for admission and that individual rights do play some role in advancement for, for individual rights in immigration law. But my studies from the United Kingdom caution me that such legal advancements will be of limited effectiveness if they are not accompanied by a more comprehensive cultural shift in notions of immigration sovereignty. So just briefly, uh, the United Kingdom made the European Convention on Human Rights part of its domestic law through the Human Rights Act. And this affects immigration law because the European Convention includes a right to family life. Article 8 of that convention establishes a right to family life. Um, now, this right is not absolute, but any government interference um, must be proportional. 
implicates the right to family life because family separation is a common consequence of removal. The starting point of the analysis under the European Convention is that family members should not be separated. The government must show that family separation would not violate the right to be with one's family and um, requires an adjudicator to consider whether family separation would be proportional. The separation must be proportional and must advance a legitimate government goal, such as national security or public safety. So in the European Convention framework, government interests play a role, but so do individual rights. Um, the balancing framework there um, less resembles the plenary power doctrine and, and looks a little different. It, it expressly acknowledges a role uh, for the consideration of individual rights. Now, the structure of the European Convention analysis is fundamentally different from the plenary power doctrine. And in the United States, there is no recognized constitutional right to be with one's family, at least in the context of immigration law. The of the Human Rights Act um, meant that in UK immigration cases, individuals could argue that an attempt to separate a family was not proportional to the family member's right to family life. So despite this legal shift away from absolute government power in immigration law, the British public never became comfortable with this <coughs> perceived loss of immigration sovereignty. This phenomenon in an article in 2014, and it's pretty clear that the public revolt against the loss of immigration sovereignty was certainly a factor in the Brexit vote in 2016. Yeah, I can say that now, 2010. Uh, the UK events, uh, while not perfectly transferable, I believe are a cautionary tale for the advancement of individual rights in US immigration law. Without popular understanding and support for a new conceptualization of immigration law sovereignty, any legal advancements may be of limited value that is ingrained in US immigration law most likely will continue. So for example, even if Jennings were to conclude that the Constitution protects those applying for admission, the protection may turn out to be pretty weak, like of the current facially legitimate standard of review, or we may see elected officials try to pull back on some other aspect of immigration law to sort of make it up for the perceived loss of immigration sovereignty. Um, given the rhetoric of uh, President-elect Trump, I'm not at all hopeful that a cultural shift will be led from the top. I'd like to propose, however, a new narrative that more accurately reflects the current status of federal power over immigration law, which in fact is not absolute in all instances, um, and will pave the way, and I hope that this uh, new narrative will pave the way to stickier advancements for individual rights um, in immigration law. So in conclusion, Here's my proposed new narrative. Individual rights and government interests are both important in immigration law. The federal government has an important role to play in fashioning immigration law policy for the country. Protecting individual rights is an important part of that role. Preserving the United States includes uplifting its most fundamental values, including the principle that absolute government power is not desirable. Allowing for individual rights to be considered in immigration law does not weaken sovereignty. It strengthens our sovereignty by helping to define who we are. It also sends even unsuccessful immigrants home with an experience to relay that reflects American values. Our country is a country that respects. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, as Ilya said, my name is Anil Kalhan. I teach at Drexel University. Um, thanks, Ilya, for the invitation to participate in this panel and to um, the other panelists for sharing their insightful perspectives. I had anticipated uh, discussing United States versus Texas, um, but for reasons that both Josh and um, uh, Jennifer have alluded to, that seemed less a hot topic. Uh, in the wake of the election and, and sort of had pulled down a little bit um, for reasons that both of them have also said. So what I'd like to do in this presentation instead is to highlight a longer term shift in the nature of immigration control, which we can see across all of the many domains in which immigration enforcement activities take place and suggest um, some of the implications that may be increasingly important in the coming years in light of this longer term 
uh, trajectory. This set of developments intersects with developments that scholars of surveillance and privacy have been studying in other contexts, uh, but the intersection of these developments with what is happening in the immigration control context has remained somewhat un underappreciated. Um, <laughs> 25 years have seen enormous expansions of immigration enforcement, both in the capacity uh, for uh, enforcement, but also the domains in which enforcement activities are taking place. Um, uh, perspectives have been studied from a lot of different perspectives, but really, you know, the proliferation uh, in the workplace is one major setting, but also in other state and local institutions, the extraterritorial projection of, of enforcement activities. On the other hand, Surveillance and privacy questions obviously have been also uh, steadily increasing in importance over the last several years across a broad range of settings, whether it be the issues arising from the uh, Edward Snowden's revelations about the NSA's bulk collection of electronic communications or more day-to-day -day forms of surveillance uh, by governments using GPS tracking and cameras or surveillance conducted by private companies in a number of contexts, and there's certainly been no shortage of attention to those questions. But the intersection between those two settings and these developments has been somewhat neglected. Even though if we look at what is happening in the immigration control regime uh, on the ground at the specific level of the techniques and technologies that are being deployed to implement the enforcement policies and objectives that are discussed one level up, um, uh, these questions are actually quite important in the immigration context. So uh, today's immigration control initiatives in any setting in which we are talking about are very much information-centered and technology-driven enterprises. Uh, at every stage at which uh, of the process of migrating or traveling to, from, or within the United States, uh, both non-citizens and, for that matter, increasingly U.S. citizens are now subject to collection of extensive quantities of personal information. Uh, for immigration control purposes, including information about immigration status and citizen, citizenship status, but also a lot of other personal information. Uh, if you've been following recent developments only in the last uh, several days or weeks, you may have seen that the government now is beginning to request social media IDs from individuals on many of its new immigration forms. Um, information has been collected. It is then subject to electronic storage, aggregation, processing, analysis, sharing, and circulation among the growing, uh, rapidly growing number of actors, both public and private, both inside and outside the United States, who are now involved in immigration control and related activities. So these techniques and technologies are changing the nature of immigration control itself and are doing so systemically across all of the different settings in which immigration control takes place. And the point is not to suggest that, any of, that all this technology is inherently or necessarily harmful. That, that all of these systems that are being deployed have potential for various benefits. Uh, but the immigration control regime in the United States has been undergoing a shift from a regime that has been primarily operating at the territorial border, depending upon non-citizens, uh, and primarily with the exclusive aim of regulating uh, migration. That regime has now evolved into become part of and integrated tightly into a broader regime that, uh, of migration and mobility surveillance that operates pretty much everywhere, both within the United States and outside, uh, operates upon non-citizens and U.S. citizens alike, and with the help of technology, increasingly has become uh, deployed for a number of other purposes and integrated with the institutions that conduct surveillance activities uh, for national security, criminal justice, but also a range of other institutions, such as transportation carriers, private employers, social service institutions, and others, in order to advance purposes that are not exclusively about immigration control as such. Um, now, the, these developments have occurred with minimum transparency, vague and undefined legal authority, and subject to somewhat limited external constraints and without much scrutiny and oversight. So the conceptual lens to which I would urge that we examine these developments is what I've described in some of my work as immigration surveillance. So in referring to surveillance, again, I mean to refer to the systematic monitoring, gathering, and analysis of information in order to make decisions, minimize risk, sort populations, and exercise power. That's a somewhat basic definition drawn from John Gillum and Torin Monaghan. I think surveillance scholars would have variations on this definition. Um, and again, in these general terms, there's nothing inherently good or bad about surveillance. But using this as the lens to understand what's taking place in the regime of immigration control, we can, we can disaggregate immigration enforcement and think about the different types of functions and activities that 
are involved in immigration control processes and then identify and think about the range of distinct concerns that might arise from those activities. So the first one, I'll identify four, um, just as a starting point. First one is identification. And, and maybe as much as anything else, the expansion of immigration enforcement has spurred the development of systems to authenticate or verify the identity of a particular individual or ascertain the identity of an unknown individual. These kinds of mechanisms, of course, have been central to uh, immigration relation, uh, regulation and understood as central for a long time. To enforce immigration laws, officials need to accurately identify who is eligible for admission or potentially subject to deportation and so on. Um, so as debates of immigration have proceeded, uh, over generations, so have debates about the proper role and scope of identification systems. So take, for example, the major debates in the 1970s and 1980s about whether the United States should have a national ID card. Now, one interesting feature of debates since the 2001 terrorist attacks is that even though discussions of national ID cards have not been as prominent as they were in those earlier periods, uh, over that period seen the development over time of a de facto set of identification systems that are being implemented for immigration control that approximate what a national ID card regime would have looked at, consisting of interoperable database systems and the enhancement of existing identification documents such as driver's licenses and passports and their integration with these database regimes. So that's one function, identification. Secondly, hand in hand with these identification systems, policymakers have implemented a variety of authorization mechanisms to facilitate large-scale analysis and screening of migrants and travelers once they have been identified in the many settings in which immigration control is now taking place. Sometimes these are relatively straightforward determinations, um, but these kinds of determination can also be more complex uh, than they appear. Um, they sometimes involve collection and synthesis of information from multiple sources or interpretation, analysis, clarification, and the exercise of discretion and judgment. Um, and in a growing number of situations, these screening determinations are made using predictive um, determine uh, probabilistic risk assessments that may be automated or semi-automated. Immigration enforcement practices have proliferated. The deployment of these kinds of screening mechanisms have proliferated as well um, and increasingly have been experienced by larger numbers of people in larger numbers of settings. Um, again, including both non-citizens and U.S. citizens. Third, the proliferation of settings in which immigration control activities take place has also given rise to extensive government monitoring and control uh, over travel and mobility. So in the wake of the 2001 attacks, officials have deemed travel itself to be an source of potential danger to public safety. So government authorities have invested heavily to develop and upgrade systems that collect, analyze, store, and disseminate detailed information about individuals' mobility and travel histories and patterns, both internationally and domestically. And using these systems, officials have developed a regime that permits travel, uh, both international and domestic, only to take place on, upon receipt of affirmative advanced government permission. That's effectively what happens whenever we board an airplane. Um, finally, information sharing and interoperability of, of database systems have become very high priorities across a broad range of settings. Uh, particularly for national security purposes, but increasingly for other purposes as well, including immigration control. Um, Congress and the executive branch have developed a variety of systems and processes to share information among various enforcement actors, including intelligence agencies, law enforcement, immigration enforcement uh, authorities, international entities, foreign governments, and again, and other institutions that are both public and private, including employers, transportation carriers, and the like. So these four sets of migration and mobility surveillance functions now play crucial roles in immigration enforcement practices across the entire spectrum of migration and travel. And they're taking place in all kinds of settings that we don't necessarily think about as connected. Monitoring and control of the territorial border, exit entry and travel control, and finally post-entry enforcement by police, employers, social service agencies, uh, and, and in a very tightly integrated way. So what are some of the implications of these developments? I'll, I'll just sketch out a couple, and then we can build upon that in the discussion if folks are interested. The first one is that the border of the United States is now functionally everywhere. On, on the one hand, it's been pushed uh, outward and extraterritorially in various respects. On the other hand, it's been simultaneously drawn deeply into the interior of the United States, especially as the actors involved in immigration control have multiplied. And that's been going on for a long time, but technology has enabled these enforcement activities to take place on a wider scale in a lot of different settings, much more efficiently uh, than before. Um, 
Now, to the extent that deference to government power and authority uh, has traditionally been at its height in the border enforcement and immigration control context, allowing the border to functionally be everywhere, then we may be tolerating an expansion of government power within the nation's interior and, for that matter, territorially, uh, without really thinking about it all that self-consciously and subjecting it to close scrutiny and oversight if that deference persists, which you know, points to some of the choices um, that, that Jennifer was highlighting earlier. Secondly, immigration enforcement and migration control practices are no longer just about identifying and apprehending citizen, non-citizens who may be unlawfully present or people who are seeking to unlawfully enter in the first place. These institutions for a much broader range of purposes um, and, and are deeply enmeshed with these other institutions. And that means that the objects of these enforcement practices necessarily include large numbers of US citizens and lawful immigrants as well. And we place, uh, tend to place a lot of trust in technology, but automated systems can present all kinds of hazards. And all of the questions that arise with automated systems in other contexts are fully present in this context as well. Uh, in terms of how opaque or transparent they are, whether there are meaningful redress mechanisms, uh, whether there's what Danielle Citron has referred to as technological due process. And then finally, a related question concerns the risk of what surveillance and privacy scholars refer to as function creep, uh, which is the gradual expansion of surveillance mechanisms beyond the uses that were originally intended or, con intended or contemplated. Um, so once you have the infrastructure in place and the data has been collected, what else will it be used for? Will the secure community system that has been suspended by the Obama administration be reactivated? When it is reactivated, is, that pos is it possible to then use that system in other ways? Will school districts be required to use that system to screen the fingerprints of teachers applying for jobs? Uh, uh, required to do so when they receive driver's license applications? Will the fingerprints of immigrant attorneys who wish to take the bar exam be stored in case they have later contact with the police? So these are the kinds of questions that we should be asking up front uh, before particular surveillance mechanisms are widely implemented and embedded in our day-to-day -day practices, but in the immigration context, we largely have not done so. These systems have been rapidly deployed with very limited transparency under relatively vague legal authority and subject to limited constraints. Um, so I'll close by just highlighting a couple of sets of questions that, that I hope folks will devote more attention to. Um, as I said, the, the, these are longer term developments uh, through different administrations. Um, but first, what are the ways in which the new administration might seek to expand the logic and particular mechanisms of immigration surveillance further? Secondly, are there effective mechanisms that can be fashioned to ensure greater transparency and oversight, uh, due process and accountability for these surveillance initiatives? Um, I think we would have had one set of answers with a different uh, election result, maybe a different set of uh, answers to that set of questions now that the new administration will be coming to power. Thank you all. Uh, I'm uh, presenting last because I'm last in alphabetical order. Uh, and I would like to present what by modern standards a very radical view, which is that under the text original meaning and other acts of the Constitution, the federal government have a general power to restrict immigration. Uh, as I said, this is radical, but I'm going to persist anyway because I'm in the company of such radicals as James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who took the same sort of radical position long before me. And in fact, what is radical today was actually the conventional wisdom for most of the first century of American history. And my aim in the article that I'm working on in this uh, issue is to recover this old conventional wisdom and to suggest that it's superior to the new. Uh, it is not my argument that the federal government can never uh, bar any immigrants of any kind, uh, but it is my claim that they can't have a, or don't have a general power uh, over immigration where they can bar people simply based on where they happen to be born. They could bar specific subcategories of people uh, under other federal powers, particularly those related to national defense and the like. Uh, so I'll start by just going through where in the Constitution might there be this plenary power over immigration that's striking. Nowhere is it specifically enumerated. If you actually read the Constitution with this in mind, it seems like no such power is actually listed. Nonetheless, uh, people have tried to find it implicitly in other powers. One place we might look for it is the naturalization clause, which indeed gives Congress the power to determine which people who are not already citizens uh, can become citizens or, or not. And I think 
Uh, certainly Congress does have plenary or nearly plenary power in that area, but as both the founders and we today understood, uh, the power of nationalization is not the same thing as power over movement. People can and do move around and live in places uh, where they are not citizens. That was true in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and certainly uh, true today. Uh, today, if you were going to ask where might there be this plenary power, we would probably look to the Commerce Clause, which has been expanded to give Congress the power to regulate almost any activity that might affect uh, commerce in some significant way. Certainly, immigration does have such an effect. Uh, but at the very least, as a textual matter and as an originalist matter, the commerce power didn't expand so far. Uh, if it did, uh, it would have been also a power to uh, regulate and forbid the movement of Americans from one state to another, because the foreign commerce clause, which might be thought to justify power over immigration, actually occurs in the very same phrase of the Constitution as the interstate commerce clause, and certainly both at the founding and for a long time thereafter, nobody or very few people would have thought that Congress had a general power to say, for example, that people living in one state could be permitted to uh, move to another. Moreover, after founding again, really until the 1930s, uh, the general understanding was that the power to make foreign commerce a power over articles of con commerce, the power to forbid the movement or regulate the movement of goods and services for sale, and simple movement of people was not understood uh, to uh, qualify under that. Uh, now, of course, you could say, even if it's not a specifically enumerated power, maybe it comes under the necessary and proper clause. Uh, it could be useful for exercising other powers. Uh, the Supreme Court has indeed defined uh, the word necessary uh, very broadly as useful and convenient in the McCulloch case, and certainly it is true that much regulation of immigration might be thought to be useful or convenient for implementing other congressional powers, but under a necessary and proper clause, it, it's not enough for legislation justified under it to be necessary. It also has to be proper, something which I've written about in some of my other work. Uh, what does the word proper mean? Well, in McCulloch versus Maryland, the court intimated that the word, in order to be proper, uh, the Congress cannot use the clause to shoehorn in what they called a new great and independent power. It had to be some power, just an adjunct or a minor auxiliary to something else. The modern Supreme Court has actually enshrined this understanding of proper in NFIB versus Sibelius. And I think it's pretty obvious that a general power over immigration is not just an auxiliary power, it is a great and independent power, and therefore can't simply be shoehorned in uh, to something else, at least not if the word proper has any reasonable and realistic meaning as an independent constraint on the necessary and proper clause. Now, some people have said that the Constitution implicitly suggests uh, that there is a general power of immigration because of the migration or importation clause, which says that Congress is not allowed to ban the migration or importation of such persons as states might want to allow in until 1808. They said, well, this restriction on congressional power only makes sense if Congress has a general power uh, over immigration. Uh, I have two responses to this sort of argument. One is that if James Madison uh, said when he wrote about this, the real purpose of this was to prevent Congress from banning the importation of slaves until 1808, uh, and essentially to use more general terms like persons only to cover up the fact that they didn't want to talk about slaves explicitly, because even though many of them were themselves slave owners, they were actually and rightly kind of embarrassed about it uh, and didn't want to explicitly talk about it. Secondly, even if you don't want to focus on what their intentions were, just look at the text, uh, the word migration being included there doesn't necessarily mean a general power over all migration. Rather, it could refer to which is a very common way of people coming into the country at that time, where essentially uh, they signed contracts with employers where they were required to work for them, usually for a period of seven years after arriving in the United States, uh, and uh, the employers would then pay their passage uh, from Europe. Under the uh, conventional usage of the time, indentured servants, like slaves, were actually considered as articles of commerce, and therefore uh, this importation uh, and migration provision refers, I think, to that rather than to any general power over immigration. Uh, finally, uh, as 
Jill has alluded, uh, I think in her previous presentation, when the Supreme Court finally did uphold the, some sort of claim that there is a general power over immigration in the Chinese exclusion cases of 1889, they said, yes, we recognize uh, there isn't actually a specific provision uh, in the Constitution which says that uh, Congress has this power, but it's got to be there somewhere. Why? Because it's inherent in the very nature of sovereignty, and they went on and on about this uh, in various ways that Jill indicated. Uh, I think there are a whole bunch of serious problems with this argument. Um, I can't go to all of them, but I'll mention a few. Uh, one is that it seems like a number of powers which are even more fundamental to sovereignty are in fact listed, such as the power to declare war, the power to raise armies, and the like. Uh, these seem like they're even more fundamental than any power over immigration might be, yet uh, the framers took trouble to list them, uh, which suggests that other seemingly fundamental or essential powers uh, which weren't listed probably were not uh, supposed to be included. Secondly, uh, if this really was essential to the very existence of the nation, it's hard to understand why the U.S. existed for something like a century without the federal government having this power. Uh, I would suggest this is a pretty powerful refutation of the idea that it's essential. Uh, it might be useful, maybe desirable for various reasons, but uh, nations can and do exist uh, without it, as proven by the fact the United States did in fact exist without it at the time. Uh, and even today, there are some nations like Argentina which do not exercise such a general power. Uh, so it just isn't true that uh, a sovereign state can only exist if it has a general power to exclude uh, peaceful migrants. Uh, so uh, I think, therefore, there's little, if any, basis for believing that under the text of the Constitution, uh, this power actually exists. Uh, now, some people have proposed more unusual and funkier kinds of arguments for why there might be this sort of general power. Some have said it might be inherent in the very nature of executive power. Others have argued that it could be lodged in Congress's power to define and punish violations of the law of nations. I don't have time to get into this in my presentation, but I think these are not very compelling arguments. I'm happy to explain why uh, in question. So far, I've mostly talked about textual and originalist considerations, uh, but I think you can make a pretty strong living constitution case against the plenary power as well. I'll mention one possible basis for that. Uh, today, we, through uh, a variety of doctrines, prevent the government from engaging in various kinds of discrimination against so-called discrete and insular minorities, groups that are historically the object of prejudice, persecution, and so forth. I think it's pretty obvious that immigrants and aliens generally qualify as such a group. They meet the criteria even more readily than some of the other groups that have been said to meet it. And indeed, we already, on 14 Amendment jurisprudence, uh, have uh, a doctrine that, as a general rule, alienage classifications get strict scrutiny. This applies to various other kinds of discrimination against aliens. I think by the same logic, uh, it should also be made to apply to discrimination with respect to freedom of movement, including movement into and out of the United States and being allowed to be here in the first place. If the Supreme Court has said uh, it is unconstitutional discrimination and overly onerous and unjustified to exclude aliens from doing things like being licensed as notaries public, uh, I think being excluded from the United States entirely and being forced to live the rest of your life in third world poverty and oppression that should deserve at least the same level of scrutiny, at least if you buy into the that alienated discrimination is a, uh, somebody should be subject to a higher level of scrutiny. Uh, finally, uh, I should note, as I alluded to earlier, that this does not mean that the federal government never has the power to exclude or restrict the movement of foreigners in any way whatsoever. Uh, it might be able, it should be able to exclude the, some, some categories of people based on its other powers, most notably uh, powers over war and national defense. Certainly, it can exclude foreign armies, it can exclude spies, terrorists, it can exclude people, whether immigrants or natives, or restrict their movements uh, if they're planning to violate some other uh, on, uh, constitutional federal law. Uh, and uh, there are other examples of this sort as well. What it does not have the power to do uh, or, uh, under the Constitution is the power to have exercise general authority to exclude anybody at once, simply 
now they can do so because they happen to be born on the wrong side uh, of lines on the map. I recognize, of course, that the Supreme Court is not going to, in the near future, overrule the Chinese exclusion cases, and that this understanding that I just outlined is not going to be the conventional wisdom <laughs> for some time to come. But as I can discuss some questions and will discuss in my article, there are a lot of intermediate steps that both courts and the other branch of government can take to begin to corral the unconstitutional power that has been created. Uh, and it need not be an all or nothing proposition. We can at least begin to pare it back at the edges, even if it's not practical in the near future to get rid of it entirely. So in sum, uh, if we truly want to make America great again, and as uh, the President-elect said a few uh, weeks ago, uh, restore the Constitution as it was originally meant to be, then we should rethink at least a good deal of our immigration policy and jurisprudence. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, uh, uh, at this point, I'd like to give the, it's a little off that I'm speaking last, but I'm also the moderator, but I'd like to give the, uh, the panelists an opportunity, if they so wish, to briefly comment on or respond to the presentation of others. I'll go first. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I think what we're going to see now um, is stuff that actually makes me uh, relieved. Um, I've long been a federalist. I love federalism. I've long been in favor of states' rights. Uh, not everyone's agree with me. Uh, but I think one of the byproducts of this election is that people will suddenly discover federalism. I'll give you an example. Erwin Chemerinsky argued that Prince Villa should be overruled. The United States should be overruled. He's here on op-ed saying that these presidents should be used to stop the Trump immigration efforts. Look, I'm all for it. Whatever we can use to pare back federal power, I'm good. Um, I, I don't personally find Ilya's theory persuasive. We've debated this before. But if the court decides to pare back the Commerce Clause and go back, I'm good with that, right? It, it, if the consequence of this is that the Commerce Clause in the Ministry of State collapses as a result of this theory, which you, know, you have to basically pare back a lot of Commerce Clause, I'm fine with that. Um, so, you know, as long as people who advocate for the commandeering doctrine, and limits on federal power do so consistently, and not only when it helps immigrants, um, then I think we're in business. Uh, but if this is merely a means to an end, that it's a one-off, then um, whatever. But I, I am fully excited to see the sorts of burgeoning federal scholarship that we will see over the next eight years from uh, the immigration community. Um, and I, I, think, I think it'll be quite worthwhile um, uh, 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 for, for, in terms of limited government. So I don't really, we only have a set order for this phase. You're not required to come if you don't like to. Well, no, I was actually, I'd be curious if you could just talk a little bit more about um, if there is no federal general immigration power, who would be setting terms of, you know, if it's, if it's not national security, if it's just, you know, what kind of workers do you want, so that kind of thing, which people be immigrating to particular States, or how would that work? Yeah, so to fully answer that, I would need a whole other presentation. Uh, I will merely say that for the most part, it would be uh, what you suggested uh, in your presentation individual rights. Uh, individuals who make agreements with employers, and landlords, and so forth. And uh, if, uh, if it would be determined by just as internal movement is, we don't say we need somebody to determine how many Californians can move to. Texas and vice versa, uh, we say let people sort themselves out, and this I think is the right approach to international migration as well, for the most part. Uh, there is a complex question of sort of what are the original meaning is the extent of state power under, over immigration. In very brief, uh, I talk about this more in the article, or we'll talk about it in the article. Uh, Pre-1868, I think there is no doubt that states had extremely broad power to exclude aliens. And by the way, also in many cases, we even to exclude, for instance, many states barred free blacks from moving into their state. Uh, after 1868, I think there are constraints on this in you know, the 14th Amendment, uh, which I think might uh, constrain some kind of discrimination by state governments against various types of aliens. Uh, so, and I can talk about that in more detail in questions if people are interested. I would like to, in very brief, uh, response to Josh's comment, 
I would note that I have actually written a good deal about sanctuary cities and federalism and commandeering and also spending clause considerations. And for the record, I've been advocating similar limited views of the spending clause and the commandeering doctrine like for many years. Yes. Now, under the Bush administration, under the Obama administration, I will do so under the Trump administration. Trump be impeached, I will do it under the Pence administration too, <laughs> it under any other administration that might happen to come to power. Uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, for, for as long as I'm right about this stuff. And, uh, and I just want to, just one more quick comment, just sort of based on what Josh mentioned, is that, and, you know, I've seen a lot of commentary, and I just, I, I just want to say, I hope this doesn't devolve, I hope we can stay focused on the issue, and I hope this doesn't devolve, devolve into something about, like, you know, um, sort of being gleeful about, you know, oh, are you being consistent with your arguments? Are you not being consistent with your arguments? And and I and I think I guess what I really what I sense and what I really want to comment on is this sort of like expectation that people aren't going to be consistent. And I think we don't know that yet. I mean, um, I think her and I both mentioned that the President has prosecutorial discretion in immigration law, and that's going to play out in the Trump administration just like it did in the Obama administration. So I would just ask that we, um, you know, don't judge what each other is going to do before it actually happens. And I would say that, you know, I, I recently wrote a blog post in the Washington Post website where I said, I'm, I'm very happy to cooperate with anybody who wants to cooperate and work together on these issues whether it's consistent with what they've said in the past or not. I'd rather that people see the light today than if we say, if you, if, you haven't seen, if you didn't see it five years ago or 10 years ago or whatnot, that means you're forever barred from doing so in the future. I, I think that's uh, taking that sort of issue is not good political strategy, but it's not actually good intellectually either. Uh, we should give people credit for uh, making good arguments and not say, well, but the good argument you're making now is inconsistent with something you said 10 years ago, and therefore we can't have you as a credible person in a conversation. Listen, I don't think yeah. that's the right way to proceed. I, I, I have in no way criticizing. If you want to make a federalist argument, that, 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 that's wonderful. Um, but at least acknowledge that these presidents were valid and still exist. I think it's difficult to simultaneously say these should be overturned, but as long as they're over here over the line, I think it's a very tough position to square away. So I think consistency is a hot goblin with little minds. And I <laughs> but actually, what I do want to say is that I think one of the things that we need to recognize when we talk about federalism in the immigration context, um, really borrowing from some of what you said about the extraordinary power, both of you have said about the extraordinary power of the federal government exercise in this area, is that the, the federal government does extraordinary things in this immigration law. They exercise extraordinary rights to fight and powers in this zone. And we have sort of long ceded to the federal government the power to do extraordinary things, extraordinary rights to fight and things. I think for many reasons, a lot of those things ought to be challenged and have been subject to challenge. And there have been limitations in the kind of uh, procedural due process realm on some of those uh, powers, but it is extraordinary. And what has been troubling in the immigration federalism context is that the extraordinary powers that have been ceded to the federal government have often trickled down to states and localities uh, without the same requirements in terms of their training, in terms of their uh, in terms of their body, in terms of their, uh, in terms of their uh, 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 sure, it, 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 mostly in terms of training and expertise. And so we've seen that those extraordinary enforcement powers in some ways implicitly ceded to actors who um, don't, uh, haven't, haven't been trained or equipped to, to engage in those practices and the practices. And that's been my concern uh, on the federalism front. Um, so my concern is, is more that rights deprivation uh, at the federal level spreading um, and are being unchecked um, when they're carried out by uh, sub federal actors as well. Um, and so I think when I have made arguments in that vein, it has been the notion that we already have extraordinary powers in the federal realm that ought to be subject to challenge but have not been successfully challenged uh, that are now trickling down to other actors where they cannot be successfully challenged because they're being, uh, they're, they're being they're trickling down in ways uh, where, the, uh, where the power is implicitly uh, accepted. Um, and so I, I think I, I think one of the things that this uh, kind of new alignment or new piece of arguments will open up is a discussion about what uh, exactly um, we're seeking to protect um, when we are talking about these sort of uh, structural arguments. And I think for, for most of us, the core concern is that individuals who are present and have been present in this country uh, often for some time are entitled to certain procedural protections and rights. Um, and that uh, kind of that 
that may, the, the arguments that we make on a structural level may take different forms, um, but, but that those are the more concerns that we have, and that regardless of the governmental actor who is engaged in the action, uh, that individuals have a particular set of rights that, um, that are clear. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's sort of, we're moving into new terrain in terms of where we expect the rights to come from, um, but that doesn't mean uh, that we don't have um, a consistent set of values and equal goals um, that we seek to achieve uh, through our um, and so I think, you know, my, my view is that it's not, you know, I guess my commitment to federalist principles is, 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 is far superseded by my commitment to the equal rights process. And I think we need to think about the structural arguments and think about how to enhance uh, the, the capacity to protect those goals. And that's, that's uh, sort of how I see this state shifting um, in the coming months and years. Um, I don't necessarily see that as inconsistent. Um, in, in inconsistent it is, I'm, I'm happy to be in favor. The extent that I ever articulate the position on commandeering in any other context, and I don't think So I know there are probably many people in the audience who have questions. I'm not sure whether, for recording purposes, you need to come up to the mic or not. If you can, it's not too much trouble. Maybe uh, you can do that. Uh, obviously, you, you, you will be recorded by the WOS, and if that troubles you about possible confirmation hearings over the future, uh, so you can take that into account. Don't worry about it. You guys are consistent. Yeah. Uh, so I can't be confirmed for anything anyway, so I'm not worried, but maybe some of you are. This is Roger Williams, Law School. Uh, my question is about the relationship between the executive branch, Congress, and the Supreme Court. Probably by sometime this spring, Supreme Court watchers will return to the question that they've returned to for the last 50 years or so, which is Justice Kennedy do. Uh, so Justice Kennedy in the Boubinette case on Davis Corpus for Hippo detainees expressed great awareness about what he called pendular swings in the public process and he described the role of separation of powers, the role of the structural constitution. And the court as saving our republic from that kind of volatility. That that means addressing this all the panels, particularly to Jill and Jennifer. Uh, do you think that that means that Justice Kennedy, in, for example, the Jennings case uh, on possible due process issues, and maybe on other issues like immigration and uh, even more robust commitment to the categorical approach to crimes that make people? Those areas, Justice Kennedy will try to push back against perceived excesses in the Trump administration to restore that balance and prevent those pendulums. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's possible. I mean, I'm not um, huge into predicting Supreme Court outcomes, but um, I definitely think that's possible. But one thing that I sort of struggle with, and I think what's evident from my talk, is you know, even if the, re the result in Jennings is a pro-individual rights result, what exactly is, does that mean? Are we still just left with the facially legitimate and bona fide standard? If so, I'm, how excited am I about that? Forward, um, but I really think we shouldn't pin all of our hopes on, you know, one Supreme Court case is gonna sort of you know, be the revolution of individual rights and immigration law. I think it's much, much more complicated than that. Yeah, I don't know if I have a, a better answer. I, I think you're right. That's the that's the sort of the, the fulcrum of hope, right? <laughs> In some senses, uh, and, I, and I do think if you look at the, the cases around uh, deportation consequences for crime, um, we've seen the court uh, be uh, being sort of a bulwark in, in some senses of sort of. Uh, the, Drawing the hard line about uh, about how aggressively um, the Obama administration and the, the Bush administration prior to that could be deportation uh, grounds the basis for eligibility, and so I think there is, you know, I think this, the Kennedy, uh, it, you know, in particular, but the, the court more generally um, does uh, kind of wake up when it, it feels like there are sort of these sorts of process concerns that sort of that, that it very squarely and it, it may be. Uh, that we see on um, things like, for example, um, the expansion of expedited removal, right? Um, which I think does raise uh, due process concerns when you're talking about people who've been present in the country for close to two years, um, which the statute authorizes, but which has never been used in any way, right?
right, that, that's an area where you might see um, a court. Uh, so I, I was very pessimistic about courts in my talk. I didn't mean to be overly pessimistic. We have seen courts doing uh, remarkable things in the context of uh, detained immigrants, in the context of, uh, of, of the uh, deportability for criminal grounds. And I do think that there will still be a role that courts will play, um, even uh, a court uh, with our students um, will continue to play and sort of uh, the boundaries between what is permissible exercises of executive discretion in the immigration personnel and where uh, those uh, exercises of administrative discretion exceed the bounds of the you know, firmly established due process rights uh, that, that immigrants have. So the way I think about Jennings in particular, just to speak to, to I, I agree with much of what Jill and Jennifer have said, is that I mean, Jennings could be a case that you know, it, its significance on its own may well be very limited. If, if, if it in fact, it, it could have a generative effect in terms of creating space for further activity, but that's not a doctrinal effect. Um, I think that's important if it happens, but you know, I mean, think about Zedvitis. Zedvitis did not, on its own doctrinal terms, have massive implications for, you know, cutting back on the scale of immigration detention, quite to the contrary. You know, so the question, you know, maybe we ask the question is, well, will Jennings be more like Zedvitis or will it be more like Demore versus Kim or Mazai? That's a sort of interesting question on doctrinal terms, but it's not actually, you know, the doctrinal significance is actually not that where the, the true significance is. I think the critic that speaks to part of what you're saying. Hi, thanks for that excellent uh, discussion from the panelists. My name is David Lewis, from Washburn University. I wanted to have a comment or a question about consistency. And as I see it, the challenge ahead is not local consistency within particular doctrines. You know, we can say the executive has broad prosecutorial discretion and continues to, regardless of changing administration. The challenge ahead is with consistency that goes across doctrines and across uh, silos of constitutional or administrative law. So for example, within federalism, consistency will have to also be at the level of preemption doctrine and the commentary doctrine. It can't just be that we're consistent with federalism throughout and consistent with commandeering. There are sort of commonalities and rationales between within the federalism doctrine, within plenary power, tying to sovereignty, tying to all sorts of um, rationales. And I, I guess if I want to put it to a question, how, how can it be that immigration is exceptional for purposes of preemption? In cases like Arizona, you see immigrant advocates and the government on the same side arguing that the government has this extraordinary and exclusive executive power relative to the states. And then in the upcoming years, we'll probably see a shift of attention to the anti commandeering doctrine, as you said, um, given, you know, given people are assuming that the federal government, in fact, does have that broad power relative to the states. How will that then translate into the anti commandeering context? It's not just you know, because part of it is that when you think about these immigration doctrines, they have a gloss of exceptionality to them. So on the one hand, the, the instinct might be to simply apply anti-commandeering straight, you know, as we get it from Prince, as we get it from New York. But what if the anti-commandeering doctrine itself is exceptional in the same way that it's exceptional for purposes of federalism and for purposes of rights? So what, what are sort of the, the arguments that you perceive that could sort of accommodate both a very broad preemption doctrine, but maybe a normalized uh, anti commandeering doctrine. So it's a good question. In the area of commandeering, I have argued, and I think uh, this is the right position, that there is nothing exceptional about immigration, nor should there be, that the same principles that apply to co commandeering for purposes of doing uh, uh, background checks for gun control or dealing with pollution or other issues will apply to commandeering of state officials for helping the federal government enforce immigration lines. There's nothing special about that situation relative to anything else. And if commandeering is a sound principle at all, which I think it is, or anti-commandeering, then it applies here. Also, with respect to preemption, I would say a couple of things. One is there are there's many different inconsistencies in preemption doctrines, not just that uh, there's inconsistency between immigration and other fields. There's also all kinds of other inconsistencies. Uh, so it's not surprising that there might be an inconsistency here. I don't think, though, that there's any necessary inconsistency between a broad preemption doctrine for immigration. I'm not saying there should be such a doctrine. I'm saying that between that and also having a strong 
anti-commandeering principle, which also applies in the area of immigration. The one is a constitutional doctrine. The other is simply <coughs> a principle of statutory construction. Uh, and I think those are two different kinds of things. Uh, and therefore, uh, there need be no great inconsistency between them. But I agree, uh, preemption doctrine is kind of a mess. And it's a sort of swamp that's going to be very hard for the Supreme Court. Do we have to drain that swamp, Billy? Is that what you're trying what? to say? Let's drain that? I was, I was, in fact, alluding to that, but apparently, uh, Josh made a less subtle allusion to the same thing. Uh, all I'm saying is. You're going to lock me up now or what? No, sorry. I'm getting to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not yet sure whether you're one of the bad hombres. Oh, I'm bad. Uh, we bad. Uh, but, uh, but be that as it may, uh, there are sort of many cesspools in this particular swamp of which immigration is just one, and I'm not hugely optimistic that the Supreme Court is going to fix all of them anytime soon or drain all of them, whatever you want to uh, call it. But I also think that uh, in the area of commandeering, by contrast, we do a fairly straightforward doctrine. There's no reason not to apply it to immigration. Uh, and uh, stick to that even if uh, preemption continues to be a swamp. And, um, as many of you in the audience know, I have efforts on bridging, building bridges between administrative law and immigration law, which at first you might think, why do you need to build bridges in immigration law, administrative law, but for various reasons. Um, and so I'll speak a little bit about the administrative law context of your question. And that is, um, you know, I think we're really now just discovering um, you know, how exceptional, if at all, immigration law is within administrative law. I mean, you're talking about a body of law that sort of has exceptionality built into it in the sense that the Administrative Procedure Act is meant to be sort of a guidepost, but has exceptionality expressly built into it. I mean, it allows Congress, sort of says to Congress, you know, here's something to follow, but you can change this whenever you want for whatever agency. I think we're now just starting to discover that. And I think one of the big impetuses for the, that was the Texas case and the guidance documents issue in that case. And I think for a lot of uh, immigration law scholars and immigration law attorneys are still discovering um, that, you know, there's another swamp in administrative law with this guidance document issue. And it's, you know, notoriously one of the like, most complicated called small, not small, but small. Um, in that, you know, the the precedent really makes it uh, capable of in case it's hard to predict predict the outcome about whether or not something, you know, was properly issued as a guidance document or whether it should have been a notice and comment regulation. So um, I think we're gonna see that issue continue to develop in immigration law. And it's gonna be especially interesting, I think, under the Trump administration because there are a bunch of um, more administrative law, generally focused bills that have been floating around Congress to sort of, you know, change the Administrative Procedure Act. And so whether or not any of those bills become law, I think will really affect the immigration law, but administrative law in general. Uh, thank you for the session. I've learned from all of you in your writing and also this morning from all of you in your comments. Um, my name is Ming Su Chen. I'm here from the University of Colorado. Um, my question is very much in the spirit of Joel's last remarks. Um, not surprised to surprise the practice. Surprise. <laughs> more interest. Um, but I'm curious to know. I mean, many of you talked today. All of you talked today about uh, executive power as it's inserted uh, vis-a-vis the states. Um, I'm curious to know about your views on executive power vis-a-vis -vis the federal agencies, um, in particular uh, within the administrative law literature, the debate over the president control over the agency action. The question that I have that would have two parts. I mean, one, what you think about the ability um, for the president to do that, the scope and the nature of that, um, but also the desirability of it, and to the extent anyone wants to harbor more predictions than we've already made today, um, what do you think the role of Trump, the Trump administration will be with regard to that? I'll take this one. I have a paper on this exact topic. So, um, about 15 years ago, Elena Kagan, who was in the Harvard Dean, wrote a paper called Presidential Administration, which argued uh, they were robust White House controlled supervision of the agencies. Um, I wrote a paper in response to it called Presidential Mal Administration that argues that often when the White House is directing administrative policy, there's reason to be skeptical of awarding deference. And I actually use as my leading example um, uh, a DAPA. 
President Obama once went on The Daily Show, it was a Colbert, one of those shows, and he said, you know, I'm bound by OLC. And, you know, if my lawyers tell me I can't do something, I won't do it. Um, Peter's laughing out loud. You, you should. Uh, uh, he ignored OLC several times. But the DAPA is a specific example. The proposal for DAPA was fairly discreet. And he kept saying, go further, go further, go further. He went through 60 iterations of DAPA. So this wasn't the president letting his lawyers define it. He was telling them where to go. So I think there's extreme reasons to doubt the legality of a program the president's directing it because he's least involved. And if you don't believe me with Obama, believe me with Trump. Maybe, maybe you'll, you'll see the light. Um, lawyers tend to be conservative. I don't mean Republican, conservative, lowercase c, that they don't want to rock the boat too much. But when you have high level people saying no, for political reasons, you need to go further, that's when lawyers say, okay, Harold Coe, what can I do to write and, ju and to justify this? Uh, lawyers find a way to justify anything. Um, we, we can do it. We, we, we can. Um, so my paper, which I'm presenting across the street in 15 minutes, called Presidential Maladministration, it's not SSRN, uh, uh, doubts whether these sorts of White House led a decision should be given deference. Uh, just a brief comment on this. This is an, uh, an issue on which I have openly been inconsistent recently with some of my previous uh, thoughts, but because I thought some of my previous thoughts were wrong or at least incomplete. I think as a matter of text and original meaning, that is wrong. That is, those lawyers are the president's subordinates. If he doesn't like the policies or legal rationales that they propose, he can tell, he can say, sorry guys, uh, I don't like him. He can even say, you're fired, right? As an ex-president might do. If he gets legal advice, doesn't like. Uh, and as a matter of just the text of contribution, the original meaning, I think that's, you know, that's correct. Also, the executive power thing as the president, not his subordinates. And just as he can issue specific instructions saying dispose of this case in this particular way, I think he can issue general instructions about which cases to pursue and which ones not to pursue. This is part of my general disagreement with Josh about U.S. versus Texas. That, however, I would make a modification to this as I have in uh, <laughs> some more recent writings, which is that uh, we currently have an executive branch which does a great many more things than was envisioned at the time of the founding, or even was envisioned 100 years ago or perhaps even 50 years ago. Indeed, it does a great many things that almost certainly would not be constitutionally permissible under the text of original meaning, and it might be very dangerous as well as going contrary to the original meaning to concentrate that much power in the hands of one person. So I'm open, or at least more open than I was before, to the idea that Congress in some cases can say, well, this agency will be at least partially insulated from complete presidential control. Uh, and I, you know, I haven't fully worked out by any means exactly where and how the line should be drawn. But I would tentatively say at the very least, though, that the courts should not on their own, in most cases at least, come out and say, well, the president can't issue general instructions. Uh, to agencies or overrule lawyers' advice, uh, unless Congress has specifically said this is at least a partially independent agency, or uh, this is an office whose lawyers uh, deserve some degree of deference uh, with respect to your judgments in certain kinds of issues and the like. So I wouldn't want there to be a sort of free floating judicial doctrine which says, well, you know, we think that the president has overrules the lawyers for reasons that we don't like or for based on arguments that we think aren't sufficiently, you know, coherent or consistent with things he said in the past or whatnot. Uh, but I am open to the idea that Congress, uh, in some cases, can say certain agencies, certain decision makers can be partially insulated from presidential control, particularly if it's in areas which uh, were not within the original scope of executive power to begin with. So just very quickly speak to, to your comment on, in, in the following, just to, which by, by way of responding to Josh as well. The, the, the DAPA litigation, the, 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 the challengers in that litigation criti criticized the, or you know, challenged the initiative as effectively substituting for legislative authority by a grant, which you know, is a peculiar thing because deferred action, as Josh noted, is not a grant of legal status. It's not a status at all. It's, a, it's an exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've sort of puzzled over in, in thinking about the litigation is the way, you know, the way, there's a different way in which um, that initiative can be understood um, that really was not fleshed out by either side of the litigation, which is that really, you know, in a, in, in, when you have enforcement on a mass scale, that you ensure fidelity to enforcement priorities, if priorities themselves are in fact legitimate and can be set, which was pretty much conceded, 
if the exercise of prosecutorial discretion by the agency in aid of those priorities is also permissible, then you know, this is not you know, something that you can just wish away, right? Enforcement discretion is gonna be exercised somehow, um, and there are rule of law values involved in ensuring, really maybe even as a matter of the take care clause itself, to ensure that that discretion is exercised in a consistent uh, uh, way throughout the agency. And I don't, you know, for the reasons Jennifer has noted, I mean, that is not a problem that will disappear. DAPA, we'll, we'll continue to have it now after DAPA. And, you know, I don't, I have yet to see challengers uh, engage this. And I've yet really to see, you know, well, certainly in the litigation, scholars have, have spoken to the litigation, you know, the, 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 the agency, the government did not really effectively speak to this. Chief Wilson, Colonel Sanders. Yeah, I'm going to comment on two questions, two specific questions. The comment goes to the consistency point earlier. To, uh, I, I guess the comment was only that it's not clear at all why we would privilege consistency over structural powers or um, federalism or other types of consistency and individual rights run, which is I think the point that Jennifer made much more eloquently than I just did. Um, the two specific questions, uh, one to Anil, I wonder to what extent you think there's a perverse and really benefit for uh, immigrants with regards to the expansion of surveillance, uh, that is if it does in fact it includes much more of the us that Joe was talking about. Um, that actually helps make arguments that uh, about the the, uh, the concerns over mass surveillance and immigration. Um, and so perhaps we even want that as a perverse matter if that's the inevitable proof of the surveillance state. The other question that's broader, I think, for both Jennifer and Jill and for anybody is to what extent um, should we be concerned as about the use of sovereignty, even if in Jill's, um, I guess, recapturing or reframing of sovereignty in a different way, to what, to what extent do we want to be concerned about the, the use of sovereignty in that way? Um, only because as a trans-substantive matter, or maybe the points that Josh made, sovereignty is also the basis of, or strong versions, robust versions of it, also the basis of hearing and, and all sorts of things and states' rights claims. And so I'm, I'm just curious, um, to what extent we want to think about the federals and concerns of immigration on law and sovereignty for any more than we want to think about it in the government. So yeah, so that's, a, that's an important point. I don't know that I would go so far as to say we would want uh, the expansion uh, unimpeded to, in order to generate that uh, response. Um, but certainly to the extent that uh, these institutions now implicate you know, the, the rights and, and uh, you know, collection of information from citizens, that's an opportunity for building sort of a, a broader sensibility and understanding of some of the potential harms and the need for accountability mechanisms and due process afterwards. I wonder if I could speak to this sovereignty question. Uh, being the libertarian that I am, I'm probably much more suspicious of sovereignty than the vast majority of other people in this room, if not all of them. Uh, however, in West, we're going to be returning to the point of anarchy. There's going to be some notion of sovereignty, both for the states and the federal government. And I think the way to prevent this from being a sort of dangerous, sort of mystical showstopper, saying, well, it's sovereignty, therefore we have to uh, eliminate or look away from uh, important concerns we would otherwise have, is to say that this is not about some free floating mystical notion of sovereignty. Rather, it's about particular distributions of power in the Constitution. Uh, so I have not made an argument that uh, it is in the inherent nature of all sovereignty that states not be commandeered. I think the argument would be that given the history, text, the original meaning and so forth of our constitution, it makes sense uh, not to allow the federal government to order uh, state officials to do its bidding and enforce its laws in the way. Uh, and it's not, it's not because any sovereign in any time and place must have a power like this, but it's because of particular structure, text, and history, and therefore we can avoid the kinds of excesses that I pointed to, pointed to in the Chinese exclusion cases. But at the same time, we have to recognize the reality that there are some allocation of sovereign powers, and we have to try to understand that in at least a reasonably consistent way. Yeah, and I'm just real quick, the only thing I would add to that, and I think you agree, is that um, you know, sovereignty does not equal plenary power. 
it's possible to have sovereignty and individual rights. Yeah. And also structural constraints and power as well. Uh, <laughs> which, by the way, I don't think I don't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm for very robust individual rights of many kinds. I'm also for robust structural constraints and power. I think these are mutually reinforcing ideas rather than antagonistic ones. Federalism protects liberty. Yes. Never forget it. Yes. No, 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 it's, no, not, not all the time, but in many cases. I think we have time for one more question, but I must ask you to make it brief because the OAS may be on the brief of taking us out of the room. We were great. I taught a call in high school. How the first to use is actually a sexual misconduct. Quick question is given uh, transposition on Muslims, on refugees, on immigrants generally, what is the best strategy, and the enormous power of the executive organization? What is the best strategy in your view to thwart his efforts? Uh, so if you've gotten more votes for Hillary, that, that would work. <laughs> if I were a great political strategist, uh, I would have prevented Trump from winning the Republican nomination or from becoming president in the first place. But I will say one thing, not that this is a single key to it, but that it can help, and that is that people who on other issues might have different views and who might normally not want to cooperate with each other, advocates of federalism, uh, people on the left and the right, libertarians, liberals, and so forth, uh, they should be able to overcome, to some degree at least, their other differences and accusations about being consistent or inconsistent, like we work together on this, the broader a coalition you have to oppose this, the more likely, in my view, at least you are to succeed. I'm not saying this is the one thing that will solve our problems, but it can help. And I would just to piggyback on that, which is to just, again, emphasize Deep's point, which is that there are lots of ways in which the exercise of immigration power implicates the rights and interests of citizens yes. uh, as well. So and we should end on a group hug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I'm going to make sure that I'm in case I actually get my act together tomorrow. So.